will be reading Mark 1, verses 14 to 34. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brothers, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they laid their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of CBD, and his brother John in a boat, putting their nets in order. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father, CBD, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went into Capernaum, and right away, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he began to teach. They were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like the scribes. Just then, a man with an unclean spirit was in their synagogue. He cried out, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw him into convulsions, shouted with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, and so they began to ask each other, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon's and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was laying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they know him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reino. If we haven't met, I have the privilege of opening up the word with you this morning. Before we start... Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we confess you as Lord. We sang this morning that you are king. And now we're going to read exactly what that means. I pray as we read your word that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts and our minds. That you would reveal to us who you are through your word. That you convict us of where we are not submitting under your Lordship, that you'll call us to you if we haven't confessed you as Lord and Savior yet. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you work uh, through this time that we are spending in the Word. I pray that you would speak through my mouth, anoint my lips, have me say the things that uh, only that you want me to say. I pray that we would be freed from distractions now and, and fatigue, and that we would spend this time digging into your beautiful, living, everlasting, inerrant, awesome word. All for your glory, Lord Jesus. I pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you don't know, we are currently preaching through the book of Mark. Why Mark? Well, at Christmas, we celebrated the birth of Jesus. In a few months, it'll be Easter. Then we'll be looking at Jesus' death and resurrection. So what is in between his birth and his death is his life. And the gospel describes the life of Jesus. So it's a great time for us to study a gospel. I do believe that if you actually study Mark, if you read it and if you reread it and if you pay attention to it, it will change your life because it is good news and it's good news about a Savior and it paints a beautiful picture of this Savior that says with these two words that he just said today, follow me. And once we start following him, it really does change everything. So if you are a believer and you read the Gospel of Mark, it will reaffirm the good news of the Gospel to you, and it will definitely challenge you to follow Jesus with everything you are and have. Let me show you a quote about the book of Mark from a New Testament scholar called N.T. Wright. He says, Mark's story allows us to see a new vision of God's people, defined by the kingdom, transformed by the life of new creation, crossing ethnic and social boundaries, having compassion for the poor and destitute, holding a faith that can move mountains, enduring under persecution, persistent in prayer. What a vision! Uh, just look at that, fam. Does anything resonate with you as you read that? 
Think about it, new creation, the kingdom, crossing boundaries, compassion, faith, strong faith, endurance, prayer. All of us, if you call yourself a Christian, are on a journey to become this kind of people, right? We're not there yet, but we are definitely pointing towards it. We are, we are longing to become this group of people. And that is why we keep studying the Bible and we keep reading the Bible and why we walk through the Bible. Because it's one of the means through which we know God and through which He brings about this transformation and change. May God shape us into this kind of people through this series. If you missed last week, uh, we did only one verse, and I did an introduction to the book of Mark. You're welcome to catch up on that on either YouTube or on your favorite podcast channel. The one thing that I did say last week that's worth repeating today is the first eight chapters of the book of Mark aim to answer the question, who is Jesus? Okay, and we are still in the first eight chapters, so that's the question that's on the table today. Now, Mark said in the first sentence of his gospel account, listen, this is who I think Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And according to me, this is Mark. That's good news. And now Mark is backing up this claim of his with story after story after story of why what he said about Jesus is true. Are you guys with me? Now, in today's teaching text, we actually skipped some verses in chapter 1. So let's just fly over them really quickly. Open up your Bible if it's a paper one. I'm looking forward to hearing some pages. If it's a digital one, I'll see your thumb do this. So just walk through Mark 1 with me. So I already said in verse 1, Mark says, this is who Jesus is. I say so. And then in verses 2 and 3, Mark says that Isaiah among other prophets in the Old Testament, said someone will announce his coming. So I've already said that he was here. Someone said, uh, 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 Isaiah said someone will announce his coming. And then in verses 4 to 8, Mark writes that someone came. And that someone who came was John the Baptist. And what John the Baptist was is he announced the coming of Jesus. And then in verses 9 to 11, we get the story of the baptism of Jesus. And through that story, Mark says, God also said so. Look at what he says about his son. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. By the way, it's a beautiful picture of the Trinity, right? God, one God, and three persons. It's all in there in only three verses. And when I read it again this week, I just... Can you imagine what it must have been like to be at the baptism of Jesus, right? I mean, you are committed to the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament. You are going to get yourself baptized by a really wild guy who says, turn, repent, and stop what you're busy with. And then all of a sudden you hear this creator and sustainer of all things, almighty God, speak in an audible voice about the person who's in the river. Just think about that. I mean, it must have been that the people who left there that day, who saw that and who heard that, it must have been that they said, listen, it's a done deal. He is definitely who he says he is. It's undeniable. And that's why Mark puts it in his story. Okay, now, in uh, verses 12 to 13, you see that Jesus gets into a fight immediately. Do you guys remember when we were small? <laughs> uh, that's years ago. We used to have those video games, two joysticks, two buttons, somewhere either in a restaurant or a spaza shop or a cafe, and it was always fighting games. They had different names, they had different characters, but it was all the same. And once you press the button, it goes, round one, fight! And then the fight starts, right? And then you go, ta -ta 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 -ta. that's exactly what happens. Think about it. Jesus gets baptized immediately, it says in verse 12, after he gets baptized, round one, fight. Why? Because, fam... That is what Jesus came to do. And who is he fighting against? He's fighting against sin, death, and Satan. Jesus is not mucking about. He's getting down to business. And he immediately gets into the fight, the fight that is here to fight and to win once and for all. Why is he into this fight? Because back in Genesis, back, 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 in Genesis chapter 3, it says that one will come who is a serpent crusher. 
and he will strike the head of the serpent and the serpent will bite his heel. So all through the Old Testament, they had this expectation that someone is going to come and settle this fight. Well, look at Jesus. Verses 12 to 13 gets into the fight immediately and wins the first round. Do you see it? Now, if you want to read a longer account of the temptation of Jesus, go to Matthew and Luke. They have longer accounts. Okay. Now, seeing that we're flying, let's fly over today's passage as well. So, in verses 14 to 15, Jesus is speaking for the first time, which is a big deal if the main character of the story opens up their mouth for the first time. We'll look at that. Verses 16 to 20, Jesus does the strangest thing. And I'm saying strangest thing, and that is calling other people into his business. Because if you think about it, he's doing 100% fine on his own, right? Round one, fight, wins, speaks, doesn't need anyone, but he brings people into it. Marawai, we will look at that as we continue reading through the gospel. And then, from verse 21 to 34, Jesus keeps on winning. He is on a hot streak. The rounds keep coming, and he wins every single time. Why? Because that is what his ministry was about, and that is what he came to do. So the last two parts of our teaching texts can be seen as illustrations of what his ministry was about and what he came to do. Are you guys with me? Okay. Now, sticking to Mark's mission in the first part of uh, uh, his gospel, let's ask the question, who is Jesus? And let me give you four answers. So there's my four points for this morning. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king of your mind and your heart. Jesus is the king of your life path. And Jesus is the king of the seen and the unseen. Let's go. Jesus is the king. Look at verse 14. I added some highlights. I'll walk through the text as we go. John was arrested. Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And then he speaks and he starts in verse 15 with, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Okay, let's just pause here. All through the Old Testament, if someone speaks, they speak on behalf of someone else. They speak under the authority of someone. That's why in the Old Testament, if the prophets speak, they say, thus says the Lord. Or they say, as it is written. Meaning, I'm not speaking with my own words, I'm speaking with the words of one who is above me. One who ranks higher than I do. Does Jesus intro his words with, as it is written? Does Jesus intro his words with, thus says the Lord? No. Why? Because he is God. And he is king. And he says what he wants to say, proclaiming it and calling it good news, not under anyone's authority, but on his own authority. We should take note of that. That is a massive claim. Because anyone listening to Jesus, wondering if he has the authority, would feel like it's not right to speak as if you're God. Unless you are God. But it's difficult for me to believe that you are God, so it doesn't sit quite right. Jesus don't care. He doesn't care, sorry. Jesus doesn't care. He just says it as it is. Why? Well, fam, because the Bible describes him, among other things, as Lord of lords, the Lord above all possible authority there could ever be. That's where the word sovereign comes from. The Bible describes him as almighty, all-knowing. No other God, no other Lord, no other king could ever get those titles. And this king rocks up and speaks as the king and then says, the kingdom is near. Why? Because I'm near. Makes sense now, doesn't it? Like the only person that could make a claim that there's a new kingdom here is the person who actually rules that kingdom. Can anyone say that Jesus is not the king? I mean, they can, if they want to. Anyone can say that Jesus is not the king. Will they be right? Absolutely not. 
Why? Because it happened. It was there to see. And for those who couldn't see it, the news still spread of this one who came, who established this new kingdom. You guys know that I'm a rugby fan, so let me call the Springboks up on stage at this point. Anyone can say the Springboks are not the world champions. And they can say it as much as they want. But they would be wrong. Why? Because it is undisputed that they are the world champions. Because they actually, historically, won a match and they got the trophy. And even if you didn't see the match, you could watch the highlights. And even when the highlights expired, you could still hear from someone that they are the world champions. So you can yap, yap as much as you want. It's not going to change the facts. And I think that's important for us as Christians. The secular age and the philosophers of this world who don't believe in God, fam, they can speak as much as they want. And they can write as much as they want. And they can publish as much as they want. They're still wrong. And it shouldn't make us nervous if anyone speaks against God's kingship. Because whether they speak against it or not, doesn't change the fact that he's king. Does Jesus look fussed in this text? Hey guys, listen, don't want to impose anything on you. Just saying, I'm going to start a little small group on this side. If you're interested, don't feel forced. Carry on. No! Jesus rocks up and he goes, the time is now. And I'm saying that because I'm the king. Jesus is the king. Let's look at the second point. Jesus is the king of your mind and your heart. So verse 15 is where we'll camp out for this one. Look at the two, it's imperatives, it's commands. Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. Think about that. The story tells us who the story is about. And then it's got this long history, and then this amazing moment, and then we see round one, fight. And then he comes out victorious, and the first thing he says is, repent and believe the good news. Why? Because the kingdom of God has come near. Why? Because the kingdom of God is supposed to fix everything that's broken. You guys see it? Tim Keller, you guys know I'm a huge fan of his work. He said the kingdom of God is, listen to it, the healing, renewing exercise of God's ruling power. Can I say that again? The healing, renewing exercise of God's ruling power. Who wants God's ruling power to renew and to heal? Obviously, everyone. And that's why Jesus makes this announcement that takes me back to World Cup 2010, Kenako! You guys remember that? Every time I heard that, I got goose flesh and I had... It was a great time. We wanted it to come. We wanted it to start. And the moment those advertisements started, we just couldn't wait. That's exactly what Jesus says. Kenako. The kingdom of God is near. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to think differently. And I also need you to believe it here so that it can lead to action. That's literally what those two words mean. Listen to it. Repent here means get a new brain. It's literally what it means. Take your brain, your noose, and get a meta brain, a brain outside of your brain, and then put the brain outside of your brain in your brain. You have to start anew. Think new. That's what Jesus says. Repent. You have to Allow him to be king of your mind. That's what it means. And then believe means put all your weight into it. Trust it with everything that you have. So here's the claim. This chair is strong enough to hold me. Come all of you who are tired and weary and take a rest. That's a joke, okay? I am a pastor. I am allowed to make pastor's jokes. The promise is I was looking for a chair and now I heard the good news. There's a chair. Someone proclaims, come and sit. Two things need to happen to me before I sit. I need to think about the chair, the action of sitting, my own body weight, and how I'm going to approach this bad boy. Absolutely. There's a lot of things that happens in here. But then, 
the only thing that will drive me to action, to actually sit on this chair, is if I believe it. With my what? With my mind. Our. With my heart. Now, I know some people say, ah, you can't think with your heart. I think you can. But you can also, you need to believe with your heart. Think about this, right? Married folk in the house. Before you decided to get married, you had to decide, yeah, that you want to marry that person. But you had to believe, yeah. That's why people don't go through with a proposal that leads to marriage. Because when the push comes to shove, they go, there's just something, I just, there's just something wrong in my heart. That's what Jesus says. I'm the king of your mind, and I'm the king of your heart. So here's what I want you to do. Get a new brain, and then put your full weight into this good news. Am I sitting? And now? And now? Ah, oh, there we go. That's my full weight. I took a seat. I believed that this chair could hold me. But it comes from here. And that's what Jesus says. Repent and believe the good news. This is what you've been looking for. You need faith to trust. You need faith to sit. I had to have faith. Because in this movement of sitting, do you guys know what? There's always the possibility that the chair might break. But, but, but how would I know if I don't? If I don't sit, I'll never know. That's faith. Can I tell you what? Up until this point in Mark chapter 1, there's no reason for you to doubt what Jesus said. Because what he said is backed up by his track record. Do you guys see it? And I promise you, as you keep reading this gospel, and you keep reading the other gospels, you clearly see that there's no reason to doubt Jesus. So why do we? Why do we struggle with faith? If, the, if his track record is perfect. Faith always asks for a leap, fam. Always. There's always the possibility that it might fail. But there's never the possibility that Jesus Christ will fail you. Because this book promises us that. And our testimonies backs that up. Do you guys realize that? Like read the Bible and find a place where God has left his people. You won't. Listen to his children. Talk about how they went through the valley of the shadow of death and God was still there. Why on earth would you still not believe it? Because you're scared. Because faith asks for that leap. And I want to remind you that all of us became children of God by taking a step of faith, and he did not disappoint us. If you are listening to me now and you don't consider yourself a Christian or you're not a follower of Christ, I want you to know that at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do so, to go, well, the king has revealed himself to me and I want to submit my life under him. And I can through grace, through his death and his resurrection that paid the price and that opened up a new way of life for us. And through His grace and through His mercy, we are saved and we reconcile to God. We can start over. We can start fresh. It's the truth for all of us. So He's the King. He's the King of our minds and our hearts. And He's also the King of our life path. Look at verses 16 to 20 quickly. Look at all the highlights. So you'll see Jesus is moving. Look at verse 16. As He passed. Look at verse 18. Immediately. Look at verse 19, going on. Look at verse 20, immediately. Fam, Jesus is getting stuff done. Jesus is not waiting idle, and he's definitely not binging Netflix. Definitely not. He's working. Why? Because there are people who need saving. And there's a new kingdom in this joint, and there are people that need to come into this kingdom. And it's his work. And now he's taking people with him to go and do the work. Okay, now look at what he says to them. Follow me. That's it. Follow me with this promise. I will make you fish for people. Did he send them home and say, think about it, and then come back to me, send me a WhatsApp? It says in verse 18, immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
the fam, Peter had a wife. Peter probably had kids. Peter had a business that was supposed to put food on the table for his family. Do you guys have any idea how big the risk is that Peter is taking here? I mean, imagine that. Uh, love, listen, I don't know if I'll be back for dinner. I also don't have dinner. Because I'm following Jesus now. I'll holler later. <laughs> That's what happened. Think about James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Fam, they are brothers who work together in their dad's business. Zebedee was the man. Why? Because he's got obedient boys. Like Zebedee had a lot of honor. People would look at him and go, I want to be like Zebedee. To have my boys work with me. Take the business forward. Mend the nets. Come on. Uh, Dad, listen. We're off. Can you guys imagine how tough that decision must have been? Because they had something going for them. Why on earth would they say yes? And why would they do it so drastically? Look at verse 17. That's the key. Because Jesus says, I have something bigger and better for you. You might think you're doing exactly what you were created for. But I know better. And I know infinitely more. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to become fishers of people. And that was enough for them to go, all right, let's go. As I was reading this text, and as I was thinking about telling you guys that Jesus is the king of your life path, I was reminded of my own story. Many of you might not know it, so let me share it with you. I wanted to become a chartered accountant. That was my vibe. Accounting was my jam. Loved myself some numbers. And I sat in a church service one morning, next to my grandma, busy studying accounting at the University of Pretoria, on my way to realize this high school and onwards dream of becoming a chartered accountant. And I heard God speak to me in an audible voice. The preacher's voice went out, God's voice volumed up, and I heard him say to me, I gave you a mouth, come and work for me, go and study theology. Voice disappears, preacher's voice comes back, and I go, Oh, okay. yeah, cool. <laughs> Why? Because he's the king, and he just told me to do something, and I'm going to do it now. That Sunday afternoon, my folks came back from a weekend away, and I said, listen, I need you guys to sit down. I've got some news, and they said, what is it? And I said, in Afrikaans, ek gaan het doe my nie word. <laughs> Means I'm going to become a pastor. And my parents looked at me, and they said, okay, it seems like you have the ability to hear God's voice, we're not going to stand in your way. That was 2005, look where we are today. I have a 17 year ministry career behind me, because God called me into it, not because I chose to do it. So I can confirm, and amen, that God knows infinitely better what I was supposed to do with my life. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to actually become a chartered accountant. Like, it, it's not even in my frame of reference anymore. Was it all smooth sailing? Absolutely not. Do you guys think that it was smooth sailing for the disciples? Can I remind you guys that three of these four gentlemen were executed for their faith? Peter, according to legend, was crucified for his faith. Jesus didn't say, come and have a phenomenal time with me and never do anything that's worth doing. Jesus said, I have something better for you, follow me. And can I tell you what it was? These guys changed the world. Do you guys realize that? These fishermen ended up becoming the apostles on whose teaching the church is built, whose books we're still reading. These lowly fishermen, amongst others. As we continue in the Gospel of Mark, we'll see those 12. Do you realize that God can do that with you too? Is he the king of your life path? And are you following him to where he has called you to go? Last one. So Jesus is the king. He's the king of our minds and our hearts. He's the king of our life path. Let's look at the last one. Jesus is the king of the seen and the unseen. 
Now, this should give us great comfort. Let me show you. So look at the first story. It happens in the synagogue. It's urgent again. You guys will see the word right away. You'll see what happened left the people astonished. You'll see that the people are astonished because they are seeing a display of authority like they have not seen before. Do you guys see it? So think, round one, fight. Round two, fight. Jesus keeps on battering the evil one. He keeps on winning. And now he's winning again. So everyone knew that he won when he faced Satan the first time. And now he's winning again. Okay, who is he winning against? He's winning against an unclean spirit. Now you'll see in this fight, the unclean spirit cries out. Do you guys see that in verse 23? And then Jesus also cries out in verse 25. Okay, so it's a good old vocal fight between these two. And then after Jesus speaks, the unclean spirit fights again. Do you guys see it? He threw him into convulsions. And he shouted with a loud voice, and then he left. And where did that leave people? Look at verse 27. It left them amazed. Why? Because they saw authority. And what authority did they see? Well, he commands and they obey. And what did they do? In verse 28, they shared the news. Do you guys see it? Why? Because this is great news. Okay, let's talk about evil for a bit. We already said that Jesus is in the fight. Why? Because evil is real. Think about our country. Think about all the violent crime in our country. Think of all the gender-based violence in our country. Think about all the isms in our country. Think of all the shins in our country. That's like corruption. Think of all the lies and deceit in our country. Do you guys think that's just South Africans having a bad day? Think about your own life. When you sin, when you lie, when you cuss, when you lust, when you lose your piggies, that means lose your mind, lose your head, lose your temper. Is that just you? Having a bad day. No, fam. That is evil. And that is evil and the evil one trying to steal what the good shepherd is trying to give us. You see, John 10 verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Only. That's his only mission. He doesn't come to steal, kill, destroy, and build an Instagram presence, and go on holiday, and go and see the Drakensberg. Do you know what I mean? He's got one mission. And that is only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And then John 10, 10 says, But the good shepherd gives us what? Life. And not a little bit of life, a lot of life. A new life. A life of vitality. Life in abundance. Evil is real. And evil is trying to steal. And evil steals by lying. Jesus says in John 8, He's the father of lies, meaning he makes up lies. That's all he does. And then Jesus says, but I am the truth, right? And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So why is Jesus fighting against the evil one? Because the evil one is stealing, killing, and destroying, and he's trying everything to do that. Now look at what Jesus says of him, to him. Be silent and be gone. Why? Because you will not speak of me. You, evil one, the father of lies, the one who only spews deceit, you do not get to testify about me. You do not have the authority to tell people who I am. Why? Because you are a liar. So be silent. And get out. And do you see what the evil one does? Does he go, ah, oh, oops, my bad, sorry, let me leave. No, he comes back with another fight. But he lost. Because it says he threw the man into convulsions, he shouted with a loud voice, and then he left. 
Jesus has authority over the seen and the unseen. We need not be afraid. Because we stand under and on His authority. Fam, you and I will not be bound by the evil one. Why? We will be free. Why? Because we know the truth and the truth sets us free. This man was afflicted and Jesus freed him from the bondage of Satan himself in the form of an unclean spirit. That is the king that we have. And Jesus is king over those things too. We need not be afraid. We also need not be bound. By the evil one. I am warning you that is his mission. That is the only thing he seeks to do to us. Let's look at the last part of the story. Once again, Jesus on the move, verse 29. As soon as something happened, uh, they left and they went on to the next one. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. So I've had the privilege of being in Capernaum. Can you guys see the parking lot on that side? That's how far they walked. Right? So people think after they left the synagogue, they all got in their cars, they put on some tunes, tuned the aircon, and then went to Atridgeville. No, it's not that far. It was right there. Like right there. You guys see the steel gate? Right there. Okay? So this amazing fight happens. Everyone goes, whoop, 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 whoop. Jesus is the undisputed champ. And then... They follow him. And then Peter goes, oh, so that's kind of awkward. Uh, I don't have space for everyone in my house. Are they still following? Are they still following? Listen, Jesus, we've got a problem here. Will you be able to sort them out? And Jesus goes, yeah, your mom will take care of us. Don't worry about it. I'll have the people over at your house. Peter rocks up at his house. What does he find? A sick mother-in-law. Look at what happens. They told him about her at once. Why? Because they just saw what he can do. I mean, think about it. It's so fresh, fam. So fresh. No social media scrolling in between. Like, I just saw it, and now I'm seeing something else. I understood what was going on there. Evil spirit inside a person speaking with the person's voice. Hey, but this is my ma, and she's running a fever. I don't know what's wrong with her, but so something caused it. I know who can help. Jesus, please. Will you sort this out for us? Can you see the faith? Up until this point, Jesus hasn't healed a sickness. He's cast out a demon. But they go, listen, if he can do that, which is unseen, he can probably do this as well, which is unseen. And look at what Jesus does. He went to her. He took her by the hand. And he raised her up. The fever left her. And she began to serve them. If you read some biblical scholars on this passage, they'll, they'll say that Jesus had unnecessary compassion on this person. Meaning, he could have just gone, uh, get up. Sorted, guys, high five. And then he starts speaking to people again. He could have done that. But he didn't. Do you guys see how tender Jesus is? I'm saying unnecessary in air quotes. Like, he's being extra. But in a good way. He touches her. He goes to her. And then he raises her. Brings her back to life. Why? Because the thief still kills and destroy. I give. And what I give is life. And I came to fight death. So as I'm fighting death, I'm restoring life. Do you guys see it? That's exactly what the Jesus does here. I want to ask you a question as I land. Do you know that this is also how Jesus treats us? Fam, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus comes to us. I wanted to say Jesus went to us, but that's really horrible English. <laughs> Jesus comes to us. Jesus takes us. He touches us. He's focused in really personally on us and he raises us and he brings us back do you know him like that that's a really important question that you have to answer now 
Do you know Him like that? Do you know that Jesus can take away what is stealing from you? Do you know that He wants to take away what is stealing from you? Do you know that He has the authority to take away what is stealing from you? Do you know that He cares? This is what He came for. He came to be king of everything we mentioned. Our minds, hearts, life paths, everything that is seen and everything that is unseen. That's the Jesus of the Gospel of Mark. Phenomenal story now, isn't it? Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you call us deeper still. That you keep on pursuing us until the day that we finally say yes to you. Thank you that your good news is for everyone. Thank you that your good news is for each of us today. If any of us made the decision for the first time now to accept you as King, Lord Jesus, I pray that they would feel liberated and that they would receive life, new life, a life of vitality, life in abundance, because we know that that is what you give us as the Good Shepherd. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, for everyone who has this endless mind-heart battle that you, would, that you would exercise your authority and your kingship there as well. That you would help us to really repent in the way that you say here in Mark. And that you would help us to believe with our full weight, trusting you because we know that you are worthy to be trusted. You have a perfect track record, Father God. Perfect! For all eternity it's been like that. We have no reason to doubt you. So if we need faith, Please give us that faith. I want to pray for us, Lord Jesus, who are at a crossroads, who need to make decisions, who feel unfulfilled, who might be wondering about what's next, who might be praying about your calling over our lives, that we would attentively listen to you, that we would see the vision you have for us, and that when you say, follow me, that we will immediately do so. Because just like these four fishermen, we know that you can use us mightily for your purposes. Make us an obedient people. People who obey right away. And Lord Jesus, it is in your name that I pray against the work of the evil one in our lives. I pray against the bondage of the evil one. I pray against the lies of the evil one. I pray against the things that steal, kill and destroy and take away from us what you gave us. That you bought for us with your own blood. I pray that a spirit of fear will lift from us and that it will leave us exactly like this unclean spirit left this man and that we would know the truth and that the truth would set us free. Let not the lies of the enemy ever penetrate our ears and go and settle in the soil of our hearts. Lord Jesus, we know that you are king of the seen and the unseen. And therefore, today we are trusting you that you keep us safe and that you complete the great work that you are doing in us. We pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.